high-tech basement headquarters. And one of the highest high-tech items in it, I suppose, was the so-called transatlantic telephone. And it, it allowed the Prime Minister to talk to the President in complete secrecy. And it was, in effect, really the first direct secret hotline. So it was behind this humble door marked with a very basic toilet lock that some of the most secret and high-level conversations of the war were taking place. But not every secret associated with the Cabinet War Rooms was so diligently concealed. Cabinet War Rooms' codename, um, rather ironically, was Number Two Stories Gate, which was its address. So I think if, if the Germans ever did find out about it, they had a pretty fair idea where it might be. The Germans expected Churchill to be rather deeper and rather further away from his normal premises than literally 10 feet underground, 100 yards from his official residence. On the other side of the war, Adolf Hitler too sought shelter in underground bunkers. These bunkers were the backdrops for some of the most dramatic events in the war. The Fuhrer survived an assassination attempt after disillusioned German officers placed a bomb in his Wolfschanze bunker complex, which was located on the border between Poland and Germany. But the most infamous bunker in the world was constructed under the Chancellery building in the heart of Berlin. The reason that bunker survived, and it survived until the very end of the war when both Soviet and later American and, and other troops went in to investigate that facility, it survived because we as the Allies did not have weapons that were sufficiently accurate to destroy that bunker. What we were doing is launching aircraft and conducting raids against that bunker, but bombs in World War II had accuracies measured in hundreds if not thousands of meters, and to destroy a hardened, deep underground facility or bunker you have to have weapons that land directly on that facility, otherwise it'll survive uh, forever. Though the structure survived the onslaught, Hitler did not, taking his own life inside the bunker on April 30th, 1945. With the defeat of Germany, America turned its full attention to the South Pacific and Japan. The death knell for the island nation arrived August 6th, 1945. The atomic blast on Hiroshima killed nearly 100,000 people and forever changed the landscape of peace and war. Bunkers seemed pointless against the awesome power of a nuclear blast. Yet the terrible weapon would lead to a bunker building explosion, the likes of which the world had never seen. Next, frightened Americans dig in deep while the Air Force builds bunkers to protect the deadliest of weapons. With the onset of the Cold War and the sudden possibility of nuclear attack, paranoia gripped the American public. You might be out playing at home when the warning comes. Stop, drop and cover became the survivalist mantra for an entire generation. The United States government did its best to allay the nation's fears. When danger threatened him, he never got hurt. He knew just what to do. Be sure and remember what Bert the Turtle just did, friends, because every one of us must remember to do the same thing. That's what this film is all about. I think in, in retrospect, as we look back on that time, I think many conclude that the uh, prospects for survival would have been very dim indeed, very dismal indeed. And, uh, but this was reflective of a time in which people deeply feared that their existence was, uh, was on the line, and bunkers were seen as the, as the solution. Despite the government's best efforts to provide protection, many Americans decided to take matters into their own hands. Backyard bomb shelters. The bunker for the man in the street became the rage from basic store-bought models for less than $100 to specially built structures that cost as much as a house. Hey, isn't this nice? Well, Sir Ruth and I certainly can live in here very comfortably for at least two weeks. And you know, this room can be put to other uses as well. Yes, Walt. You could use this as an extra bedroom for company. Yeah. As the United States came out of the Second World War, we had massive armies, we had developed nuclear weapons, we had crushed two enemies. Con contrast that with the condition in the United States beginning in the 1950s 
when the Soviet Union in 1949 detonated a nuclear weapon. We now, for the first time in our history, faced absolute vulnerability. We never before had faced a time in which our survival, our existence, could be eradicated on the order of 30 minutes. And the reaction was to build bunkers throughout American society, both on the governmental level and the military level, as well as bunkers throughout American society, in many cases within residences. Wall Street analysts in the 1950s projected the bomb shelter business as a potential $20 billion industry. But this was a quiet building boom. The construction and subsequent storage of food, water, and supplies in underground shelters was performed secretly, not from fear of the Russians, but from fear of one's own neighbors, fighting for cover during a missile attack. Ironically, the best Cold War bunkers did not protect people from nuclear weapons, but instead protected the nuclear weapons themselves. Buried deep in the desert flatlands outside of Tucson, Arizona, sits one of the most advanced and potentially deadly bunkers ever built. The facility and others like it were designed to protect and, if necessary, launch America's largest intercontinental ballistic missiles, the Titan IIs. Built as a retaliatory weapon, the missile could be launched in less than 10 minutes by a two-man crew operating deep within the facility. A Soviet missile sent to destroy the bunker would take just over half an hour to reach the site. By that time, the 103-foot Titan II would be thundering toward its Russian target. Constructed in the early 60s, the Titan II missile facility is comprised of a 146-foot deep silo and adjoining command center. The structure took nearly a year and a half to build and cost over $8 million. Like the Cheyenne Mountain Bunker in Colorado, the Titan II facility was built to roll with the punches in the event of a nuclear strike. Everything in here is shock isolated from the missile down to the smallest piece of equipment. That means they're mounted on springs. So should there be a ground movement for any reason, uh, the equipment is not going to break. It's just going to move around. The facility could also be closed off to the outside world during an attack. complex, we've just come through an area that's very well constructed but not hardened against attack. But once we go through a series of three-ton blast doors like this one, we will be in the hardened part of the complex. There's a set of uh, blast doors protecting the control center from the outside force and another set protecting it from the silo. But the largest door is not inside the bunker at all. It's on top. The enormous 740-ton sliding silo door could be opened in 27 seconds. When closed, the door shielded the facility to help the structure survive a near hit by a nuclear weapon. By 1963, no less than 54 Titan II missile sites were operational throughout the country, ready at a moment's notice to obliterate an enemy target. Ironically, despite their construction and secrecy, Nearly all the missile sites were knocked out, though not by an enemy attack. Fifty-three of them were dismantled as part of a mutual disarmament pact between the two superpowers. Today, the Arizona bunker is the last that remains in its original form. It now draws visitors as a national historic site and stands as a testament to both bunker ingenuity and just how close we came to nuclear war. Next, smart bombs wreak havoc in Iraq during the Gulf War, while the underground bunker meets its high-tech end. The Gulf War. As Desert Storm began, the Iraqis entrenched their forces in Iraq to defend against the onslaught of US-led coalition troops. An estimated 57,000 bunkers and fortified structures housed everything from artillery to Saddam Hussein himself. But the sense of security provided by these bunkers was quickly shattered. Nothing could have prepared the Iraqi troops 
for the new generation of American air-to-surface weapons. Nightly news reports showed video shot from the nose of these devastating bombs as they hit their mark precisely. The war with Iraq suggested bunkers are no longer viable military options when fighting well-organized and technologically advanced militaries. And the U.S. Armament Center at Eglin Air Force Base wants to make that a reality. Occupying an area two-thirds the size of Rhode Island, the Air Armament Center on the Florida Panhandle builds and tests state-of-the-art bunker-busting weapons. Here, test pilots and scientists are able to perfect the guidance and delivery systems for these bombs by dropping them as if in a real battle situation. When we're testing uh, bunker buster type weapons, uh, the idea is to uh, put the weapon on the target. Uh, ultimately, you plan a specific route to get to the target and uh, you release the weapon at a specified range from the target. The weapons are so accurate, they can be dropped by planes up to 10 miles away and hit within feet of their target. Special fuses, guidance systems, and the ability to burrow underground make these bombs perfect bunker killers. But how do you test the individual components of a weapon that travels over a thousand feet per second and is vaporized within milliseconds after impact? We use our sled track tests. Four, three, two, one. These sled tracks are like a railroad track going down for a long distance. We put rocket motors behind an actual bomb, and we have these things propelled down at the exact same speed that they would see when they hit the ground. At the end of the sled track, we build an actual bunker. Now we'll build it with the protection that we normally see in the ground. We have the hardened concrete, we have layers of dirt, and with that, what you can see is that we can test any of our warheads very effectively, just like it were flight tested. High-speed cameras and electronic test equipment catch the apocalyptic destruction unleashed in a fraction of a second. I do see a time when bunkers will no longer be a utility military protection because we do have uh, much more capable weapons in our inventory. Despite their practical limitations, bunkers still continue to be built. Humans will always have an instinctual need to be protected and taken out of harm's way. The bunker mentality is as old as nearly any thought process. And as long as this